10, The High Table. While telling the story of the game and anticipating the coming fight, Bond's face had lit up again. The prospect of at least getting to grips with the sheaf stimulated him and quickened his pulse. He seemed to have completely forgot the brief coolness between them, and Vesper was relieved and entered into his mood. He paid the bill and gave a handsome tip to the sommelier. Vesper rose and led the way out of the restaurant and out onto the steps of the hotel. The big Bentley was waiting, and Bond drove Vesper over, parking as close to the entrance as he could. As they walked through the ornate anterooms, he hardly spoke. She looked at him and saw that his nostrils were slightly flared. In other respects, he seemed completely at ease, acknowledging cheerfully the greetings of the casino functionaire. At the door to the salle privé, they were not asked for their membership cards. Bond's high gambling had already made him a favored client, and any companion of his shared in the glory. Before they had penetrated very far into the main room, Felix Leiter detached himself from one of the roulette tables and greeted Bond as an old friend. After being introduced to Vesper Lind and exchanging a few remarks, Leiter said, Well, since you're playing Baccarat this evening, will you allow me to show Miss Lind how to break the bank at roulette? I've got three lucky numbers that are bound to show soon, and I expect Miss Lind has some too. Then perhaps we could come and watch you when your game starts to warm up. Bond looked inquiringly at Vesper. I should love that, she said. But will you give me one of your lucky numbers to play on? I have no lucky numbers, said Bond unsmilingly. I only bet on even chances, or as near them as I can get. Well, I shall leave you then, he excused himself. You will be in excellent hands with my friend Felix Leiter. He gave a short smile which embraced them both, and walked with an unhurried gait towards the case. Leiter sensed the rebuff. He's a very serious gambler, Miss Lind, he said, and I guess he has to be. Now come with me and watch number 17 obey my extrasensory perceptions. You'll find it quite a painless sensation being given plenty of money for nothing. Bond was relieved to be on his own again, and to be able to clear his mind of everything but the task on hand. He stood at the case and took his 24 million franc against the receipt which had been given to him that afternoon. He divided the notes into equal packets and put half the sum into his right-hand coat pocket and the other half into his left. Then he strolled slowly across the room between the thronged tables until he came to the top of the room where the broad baccarat table waited behind the brass rail. The table was filling up and the cards were spread face down, being stirred and mixed slowly in what is known as the croupier shuffle, supposedly the shuffle which is the most effective and least susceptible to cheating. The chef de partie lifted the velvet-covered chain which allowed entrance through the brass rail. I've kept number six as you wished, Monsieur Bond. There were still three other empty places at the table. Bond moved inside the rail to where Houssier was holding out his chair. He sat down with a nod to the players on his right and left. He took out his wide gunmetal cigarette case and his black lighter and placed them on the green baize at his right elbow. The Houssier wiped a thick glass ashtray with a cloth and put it beside him. Bond lit a cigarette and leant back in his chair. Opposite him, the banker's chair was vacant. He glanced round the table. He knew most of the players by sight, but few of their names. At number seven on his right, there was a Monsieur Sixt, a wealthy Belgian with metal interests in the Congo. At number nine, there was a Lord Danvers, a distinguished but weak-looking man whose franc were presumably provided by his rich American wife, a middle-aged woman with the predatory mouth of a barracuda who sat at number three. Bond reflected that they would probably play a pocky and nervous game and be amongst the early casualties. At number one, to the right of the bank, was a well-known Greek gambler who owned, as in Bond's experience apparently everyone does in Eastern Mediterranean, a profitable shipping line. He would play coldly and well and would be a stayer. Bond asked the Houssier for a card and wrote on it, under a neat question mark, the remaining numbers, 2, 4, 5, 8, 10, and asked the Houssier to give it to the chef de partie. Soon it came back with the names filled in. Number two, still empty, was to be Carmel Delane, the American film star with alimony from three husbands to burn, and, Bond assumed, a call on still more from whoever her present companion at Royale might be. With her sanguine temperament, she would play gaily and with panache, and might run into a vein of luck. Then came Lady Danvers at number three, and number four and five were a Mr. and Mrs. Dupont, rich-looking and might or might not have some of the real Dupont money behind them. Bond guessed they would be stayers. They both had a business-like look about them, and were talking together easily and cheerfully as if they felt very much at home at the big game. Bond was quite happy to have them next to him. Mrs. Dupont sat at number five, and he felt prepared to share with them, or with Monsieur Sixt on his right, if they found themselves faced with too big a bank. Bond had just finished his sketchy summing up of the players when Le Chief, with the silence and economy of movement of a big fish, came through the opening in the brass rail and, with a cold smile of welcome for the table, took his place directly opposite Bond in the banker's chair. With the same economy of movement, he cut the thick slap of cards which the croupier had placed on the table squarely between his blunt and relaxed hands. Then, as the croupier filled the six packs with one swift exact motion into the metal and wooden shoe, Le Chief said something quietly to him. Monsieur, Madame, les jeux sont faits, un bagon de cinq cent mille. And, as the Greek at number one tapped the table in front of his fat pile of hundred mille plaques, le bagon est fait. Le Chief crouched over the shoe. He gave it a short, deliberate slap to settle the cards, the first of which showed its semicircular pale pink tongue through the slanting aluminum mouth of the shoe. Then, with a thick white forefinger, he pressed gently on the pink tongue and slipped out the first card, six inches or a foot, towards the Greek on his right hand. Then he slipped out a card for himself, then another for the Greek, then one more for himself. He sat immobile, not touching his own cards. He looked at the Greek's face. 
With his flat wooden spatula, like a long bricklayer's trowel, the croupier delicately lifted up the Greek's two cards and dropped them with a quick movement an extra few inches to the right so that they lay just before the Greek's pale, hairy hands, which lay inert like two watchful pink crabs on the table. The two pink crabs scuttled out together, and the Greek gathered the cards into his wide left hand and cautiously bent his head so that he could see, in the shadow made by his cupped hand, the value of the bottom of the two cards. Then he slowly inserted the forefinger of his right hand and slipped the bottom card slightly sideways so that the value of the top card was also just perceptible. His face was quite impassive. He flattened out his left hand on the table and then withdrew it, leaving the two pink cards face down before him, their secret unrevealed. Then he lifted his head and looked Le Chiffre in the eye. No, said the Greek flatly. From the decision to stand on his two cards and not ask for another, it was clear that the Greek had a five or a six or a seven. To be certain of winning, the banker had to reveal an eight or a nine. If the banker failed to show either figure, he also had the right to take another card, which might or might not improve his count. The chief's hands were clasped in front of him, his two cards three or four inches away. With his right hand, he picked up the two cards and turned them face upwards on the table with a faint snap. They were a four and a five, an undefeatable natural nine. He had won. Neuve la banque, quietly said the croupier. With his spatula, he faced the Greek's two cards. Et le set, he said unemotionally, lifting up gently the corpses of the seven and queen and slipping them through the wide slot in the table near his chair, which leads into the jib metal canister to which all dead cards are consigned. The chief's two cards followed them, with a faint rattle which comes from the canister at the beginning of each session, before the discards have made a cushion over the metal floor of their oubliette. The Greek pushed forward five plaques of one hundred thousand, and the croupier added these to the chief's half-million plaque, which lay in the center of the table. From each bet, the casino takes a tiny percentage, the keg not, but it is usual at a big game for the banker to subscribe these himself, either in a prearranged lump or by contributions at the end of each hand, so that the amount of the bank's stake can always be a round figure. The chief had chosen the second course. The croupier slipped some counters through the slot in the table which receives the cagnot and announced quietly, Un bancon d'un million. Sauvé, murmured the Greek, meaning that he exercised his right to follow up his lost bet. Bond lit a cigarette and settled himself in his chair. The long game was launched, and the sequence of these gestures and the reiteration of this subdued litany would continue until the end came and the players dispersed. Then the enigmatic cards would be burnt or defaced, a shroud would be draped over the table, and the grass-green bay's battlefield would soak up the blood of its victims and refresh itself. The Greek, after taking a third card, could achieve no better than a four to the bank's seven. Un bancon de deux millions, said the croupier. The players of Bond's left remained silent. Banco, said Bond. 